All right, so we're going to be talking about life. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about, guys, okay, your definition of life. So did you guys have anything that you wrote down that kind of was your big, maybe overall reaching definition of life? Or characteristics of life when you did that entrance slip? What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be alive to you? You live? You don't know? Okay, I'll give you I'll give you the scientific definition of life after this next slide. Do you guys know of any maybe First Nations Aboriginal stories of what life means, what life is? And if you don't feel comfortable sharing this, fine too. So I took an Indigenous science class uh, or teaching indigenous science class over the summer, and it was awesome. Um, and we did talk about this. Um, so the what they kind of talked about. So we had some elders come in. We watched some videos of some elders speaking, and kind of what the overarching theme for you know many different um, First Nations was that everything is alive. Everything has energies, and all those energies flow together and around and that exchange of energy is what kind of constitutes life. Okay, so when I heard that, I kind of equated it to a Western perspective of life, right? When we think of something being alive, we think of it, you know, moving and metabolizing and eating things and, and if you think about it, so the, a tree, let's say, or, or a plant that you eat takes its energy from the sun, right? It uses that energy to grow. Maybe a cow eats that plant and that helps that cow grow. And then one day I have a steak dinner and that steak dinner helps me grow. So all that energy is kind of transferred through to that flow of life. So that's kind of what I learned. I don't know if there are different stories in your communities, but that's just kind of what I learned. I'm hoping to make some connections with some elders this year to have some more local knowledge on the, the topic. All right. So, I'll have some soda. Thanks, Shana. All right. A scientific definition of life. Just one second. All right. So... The scientific definition of life is really long and convoluted and full of lots of sciencey words. Okay, so um, since there's no unequivocal definition of life, which means there's no like absolute definition of life, the definition of life for every culture is different. But um, science has kind of come up with an understanding of what it means to be alive. Okay. Um, Life is considered a characteristic of something that is, exhibits all or most of these traits. Okay, so homeostasis is the regulation of an internal environment to maintain a constant state. For example, electrolyte concentration or sweating to reduce temperature. Okay, so our body is always in that constant flow of keeping us warm. Right, if we get too hot, we sweat and we cool off. If we get too cold, we start shivering and our body heats up, okay? Organization, okay, so being structurally composed of one or more cells, and cells are that, those basic units of life. Uh, metabolism, so the transformation of energy by converting chemicals into energy, uh, and energy into cellular components, and decomposing organic matter. Uh, living things require energy to maintain internal organization, 
uh, and to provide their other phenomenons associated with life. So we need to make sure that our, our systems are regulated, one or more cells, and that we take in energy somehow. Okay, growth, so they maintain uh, maintenance of a higher rate of anabolism and catabolism, which is kind of up here. Um, growing organisms increase in size in all of the parts uh, rather than simply accumulating matter. Okay, so rather than just taking things in, we take things in and we grow. We get bigger, we change. Um, adaptations, so living things have the ability to adapt to their environment. Okay, uh, if a tree doesn't have enough light, it's going to grow taller to get to the sun. If we don't have enough food, we're going to go somewhere where we can find more food. So we can adapt to our environment. Um, a response to stimulus. So this can take uh, many forms. So from the contraction of a unicellular organism, so if you poke an amoeba, it's going to move. It's going to move away from you. Um, to internal chemicals. Uh, to complex reactions involving sense and multicellular organisms. Uh, a response is often expressed by motion. For example, the leaves of a plant turn toward the sun, um, or like some leaves, when you brush them, they, they fold up, right? So even plants, they respond to different stimulus. Um, and then, of course, reproduction, because if an organism doesn't reproduce, it's not going to pass along its genetics. Um, so the ability to produce new individual organisms, either sexually uh, from a single parent organism Sorry, asexually or sexually from two parent organisms. So, okay? Cool. Lots of sciencey stuff there. All right. Uh, so, just kind of from what I said about um, my understanding of kind of the Aboriginal definition of life and that scientific definition of life, do you think we could fill in a Venn diagram? So basically we could, we'd have like Aboriginal here and we'd have Western here and then we'd have both here. Okay, so maybe you look at that slide that has all those different characteristics and we can maybe see if some of them fits in one or the other or both. Organization? Okay. What else? Okay, where would we put growth? In the middle. In the middle. I say most of the, both connect in a way. Most of the, mostly everything on this slide, but it's just, the last year is more complex and the Aboriginal is just more to do with it, sort of, in some type of way. So could we maybe say that the Aboriginal is kind of more circular? Is that kind of what you're thinking? And then Western, they're just all these different. Yeah. So just kind of like. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. That, right? So just kind of a list of facts. Circular, if we say like everything provides it goes, something. It goes in a pattern to it. Everything follows a pattern. Okay. Anything else you want to add? No? Good? Okay. Cool. All right. Viruses. Are they alive? <laughs> no, I don't think they're alive. 
So then what are they? This virus is? It's kind of kind of cool that they can make you sick even though they're not, not really anything, right? They're just things that float around that... It's kind of weird and icky. Yeah, so like a virus is like a cold, right? And like your infection is yeah. a bacterial yeah. infection. So that's why antibiotics can kill bacteria and not viruses. Right. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. So you could maybe even look at it like that, right? You can't kill a virus. So it's... Right? It just has to... Because you can't kill you it. You can't kill it. Maybe that's the way you could look at it. All right. Now we're going to look at some scientists that have kind of helped us understand what life is. Okay? So, Francisco Reddy, um, touted to be the father of experimental biology. So he's best known for disproving the theory of spontaneous generation uh, with a study he published in 1668. Um, so he proved through a scientific experiment that maggots didn't spontaneously appear on rotting meat. So up until this point, people just believed that if you left meat out, that maggots would just appear. They would just come and they would pop out of the meat and they would be there. Okay? They didn't understand that flies actually had to come and lay eggs on your meat in order for larvae or for the maggots to appear. So Tasha Thompson to the office, Tasha. So what he did was he took two pieces of meat, put one in an enclosed setting where flies couldn't get to it, and then one in an open setting where flies had free reign. And he was able to show that the one that was closed up sat out just as long as the one that wasn't and didn't have maggots. Okay? All right, so Louis Pasteur. Does Pasteur kind of remind you of anything? Maybe to do with dairy products? Cows? Pasture. Pasture. Pasteurize? You guys know what that means? So the milk, I think. The milk, yeah. So you pa when you pasteurize milk, you heat it up really quickly, and it kills the bacteria that's in the milk. Yeah. So that people don't get sick. Um, so he is renowned for his discovery of the principles of vaccinations, uh, microbial fermentation, and pasteurization. He also disproved the theory of spontaneous generation, uh, which... Francisco Reddy did as well. In 1862, he proved that microorganisms did not spontaneously grow out of boiled broth unless they were introduced. Okay, so he boiled the broth, which killed it, which killed all the bacteria, and then, you know, unless he put some infected broth into the sterilized broth, nothing grew. Um, he proved that microorganisms could be airborne. All right, Miller, the Miller-Urey Miller experiment. In 1953, Stanley L. Miller and Harold C. Urey conducted an experiment which would change the approach of scientific investigation into the origin of life. They took molecules which were believed to represent the major compounds of the Earth's early atmosphere and put them in a closed system. Uh, they, or he ran a continuous electric circuit through the system to simulate the lightning storms believed to be common on the early Earth. After one week, 10 to 15% of the carbon had been formed into organic compounds. This shows that compounds essential to cellular life could be easily made under the conditions that were believed to have been present on early Earth. So how, how do you think this helps us in the understanding of what life is? The understanding of where life came from? Sorry, that was your question. How, how does this experiment help us understand where life came from or how life arrived on Earth? I don't know, we took non living things, I'm guessing, from something that was there before them. So okay. they're trying to generate something, kind of taking a stab in the dark and saying this was before us and like. Right. Yeah. So they kind of tried to reproduce those beginning Earth um, conditions to see what would happen. And they saw that these organic compounds were forming, so then they could say that, yeah, these organic compounds are forming, which means there must be something to how we thought 
earth was first made. All right, Lynn Margulies. Margulies studied uh, studies in the 1960s developed theories about how cells gained their energy systems. So mitochondria and chloroplast. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. There's lots of jokes floating around the internet about that's the only thing that you learn from Bio30 is that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Anyways, um, and then chloroplast is how um, leaves take in energy from the sun and create sugars. Um, so Margulies believed that organelles were totally separate symbiotic bacteria that developed into an integral part of cells. So basically she believed that way before there were like really um, serious multicellular organism, organisms, there were these little tiny unicellular organisms, so one cell, and then these little bacteria. And the bacteria said, ooh, if I go live in here, I'm going to be comfy, nothing's going to eat me, you know, it's going to be great. But, you know, you got to give, give and get, right? So maybe that little mitochondria went and lived in the cell, and the, the reason the cell was, like, was cool with it is because that mitochondria was providing energy to the cell, which allowed the cell to reproduce faster and quicker. Okay? All right, so cell theory. Um, the scientific theory which describes the properties of cells. These cells are the basic units of structures in all organisms and also the basic units of reproduction. There are three main ideas to comprise cell theory. Um, all living organisms of are comprised of one or more cells. Um, cells are the most basic unit of life, and all cells arise from pre-existing cells, living cells. So that's kind of that. All right, one last video.